Welcome to Back on the Broomstick, a modern witch's spoken word grimoire, where two witchy friends from way back are reconnecting to their pagan roots after a long period of mundanity. We're rewalking the path of the wise and trying out all the latest spells, rituals, and magical theory in today's witchcraft and pagan practices. So grab your wand and your incense, your cauldron and your crystals, and join us as we get Back back on on the Broomstick. Hi, and welcome to Back on the Broomstick. In this episode, we'll be talking about the Wheel of the Year holiday of Beltane, and also about a type of magic that goes hand in hand sometimes with Beltane. We'll be talking a little bit of sex magic today as well. I'm Layla. And I'm Shell, and I'm so excited about this next notch in our wheel. This is a good one. Beltane has always been one of the favorites, in particular in our community. It was the first outdoor ritual. It was the first time it was warm enough and nice enough for everyone to get together outside, get our toes in the grass and in the dirt. Now, the reason we're kind of pairing this with sex magic is A, we had a listener ask, and B, because the whole fertility thing with Beltane, they really do kind of go hand in hand. And honestly, when I think Beltane, I am like, this is the first time I can go camping and go out frolicking in the woods. Beltane is May 1st in the Northern Hemisphere, and in the Southern Hemisphere, we would be saying Happy Samhain right now. Beltane is a fire festival. It's about fertility. It's the height of spring, and it's the very first glimmerings of summer. Traditional Irish festivals, it was actually considered the first day of summer. And it's all about sexuality, sensuality, vitality, passion, joy, and the beginnings of abundance. Well, we can't forget the other thing um, that Beltane signifies, especially here in the Northeast. The thing that that coincides with Beltane is it's opening a camping season, my friends. Oh, yeah. Hooray, hooray. The first of May outdoor camping begins today. Right. And, (laughs) you know, another thing, and we'll talk about this in a minute. And I know that this is one of the things that you love more than anything about Beltane. I also want to talk about flower crowns. I do love flower crowns. I also think of flower crowns when I think of Beltane. Obviously, you can make them all summer long, but there's something about Beltane and flower crowns. Traditionally, flower crowns were used to mark the queen of the May. People also would decorate their windows, their doors with flowers, again, to signify that abundance and to honor the goddess who's in her maiden, like blossoming into mother phase. She's she's looking for a mate. Her fertile myrtle stage. Exactly. (laughs) Flowers are also associated sometimes with the fae. And May 1st is also a time of fairy magic. It's a time when traditionally the Tuatha de Danann were considered to have come into Ireland on May 1st. And you can honor them on that day by leaving offerings of food or money sometimes by water or in your garden. Now, I just want to throw in here, left turn real quick, fun shell fact So we've talked about in the past about how I kind of grew up in some non really religious atmosphere. Mm -hmm. My grandma always made us celebrate May Day. We would make baskets and my family was big on like ceramic making it. I don't know. Ceramics were a big thing. And I remember as a kid painting ceramic. They looked like wicker baskets, but they were ceramic. And then we would put we'd go out in the yard and put flowers in them. Now, ask my grandma. We were not pagan or involved in witchcraft whatsoever. But I remember making these May Day baskets and doing the whole flower thing. There was a song. I don't recall it, even in my bad singing voice. You know, I'd sing it if I did. But I think May Day is celebrated kind of by everyone is like that. Put your winter clothes away. You know, you can finally go outside. You know, here in the Northeast, that's really the beginning of planting season. Like the world opens up May 1st. It really does. And and it's not just that I get to go outside barefoot then either. There's so much more that happens. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned painting the ceramic baskets because there was a tradition in my family that my grandmother would have. She'd get all the grandkids together. And it was paper, though. She usually used newspaper. But she'd have all these flowers that she had gotten, some of her first flowers from her garden, a lot of daffodils, some tulips, you know, some of those bluebells and things like that. 
and she would wrap them up in paper and then she would send her army of grandchildren. Now, this is a woman who had nine kids Yikes. and they all had many multiples of kids of their own. Damn. Right. She'd get all like 25 of us or whatever together. And she'd get each of us these newspapers all prettily wrapped with a couple flowers in them. And what we were supposed to do is run to a neighbor's house, put it on their porch, ring the bell or knock and run away. What'd you really do? That's what we did. No, that's exactly what we did. <laughs> it was fun. It was kind of like ding dong ditch, but you left the flowers there on May 1st. I love how our non-pagan grandmothers <laughs> celebrated all these holidays. My non-pagan, very Christian grandmother said it was to bring luck and fertility and blessings to the houses that you did it to. So She's a witch. She's a witch. I know she was. She gave me my first deck of tarot cards. So she was definitely a very spiritual lady, but she never would have said she was a witch. Never, never. So giving flowers and things like that is very traditional, especially yellow flowers. And I've also heard that it's considered bad luck to bring hawthorn flowers into your house except on May 1st. Beltane. On Beltane, you can bring them in and it brings blessings to the house. Now, I would be re remiss if I didn't mention this, especially for my coven peeps who are listening. Love you guys. I'm not allowed to call it Beltane. I want to say what, oh, Colin Mai. Okay, got it. Oh yeah, that's the Welsh word for it. Seriously, well, they'll be like, oh yeah, well, we're going for blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll be there at Ostara. And I'm like, you got it, you got to learn and I'm like, oh, Beltane? And like, I learn. <laughs> yes, because you are in a formal tradition now and you have to do it the way of the tradition. After 30 years, it's fucking Beltane. Colin Mai is hard for me to, like, I'm having a hard time adapting to new words. It will always be Beltane in our hearts. <laughs> it will be. I'm willing to argue the Mabin thought, but yeah, Colin Mai. So I wanted to mention that I am trying to learn in my Welsh traditional coven, if I'm saying that wrong, I apologize. I'm learning here, people. So my point is, is that different people call it different things, but Beltane is probably the most standard name. Beltane means the fires of Bel. Sometimes people say there's a god named Bel, who's the grain man, and Tane, which is fire. There is a tradition of jumping the bale fire at Beltane, um, especially if you are looking to either become pregnant or get married. I've jumped the fire. I've done it. It worked. Got a beautiful son to prove it. But let's talk real quick about the, the tradition of jumping the fire. What's that all about, Layla? That came from, again, traditionally Irish. Uh, ancient Irish people would put out all the fires in their home. And especially back in the day, it wasn't as easy as it is today to kindle a fire. So that was a pretty big thing. If you put out your hearth fire, that that's pretty significant. So they put out all their fires and they'd go to, you know, some place in town or out of town where the bale fire was kindled, a big, huge bonfire, usually two of them. And they would pass their cows through to get their cows blessed or their cattle or their sheep. People would leap the fires, like Shell said, to uh, hand fast or to ask for a lover. They'd also leap for fertility or to purify themselves because these are considered holy fires. And then at the end of the celebrations, people would take that fire back to their house and rekindle their hearth fires from the central fire. So everyone would share in that same fire. And actually, I've read in a couple of places where people try to keep that fire burning, actually, all the way till Samhain. They'll bring it in as like a hearth fire, an in-home fire, so to say, and that they would try to use it for cooking or what have you within the home and never let that fire die until Samhain. And we do know that Beltane is one of these celebrations that is definitely ancient. In the 10th century BCE, there's a, a king known as Sanus Cormac. He was an Irish bishop king, and he wrote Beltane took place on May 1st to celebrate the beginning of summer. In this writing, he talked about that they would make two fires to drive the livestock through. So we do know that this is a celebration that is at least a thousand plus years old. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, I, I also look at Beltane, like you had said a little bit ago, as kind of a new greeting with the fairies, so to say. I look at it as like the fairies, kind of like a lot of things in the winter. In my opinion, I could be wrong. Who the hell am I? But I kind of see them like going dormant for the winter, like hibernating. You know, like how the bees go away for winter. I feel mm -hmm. like, in my opinion, the fairies kind of go away for the winter. 
And I feel like this is like their awakening where they come out where you want to leave things for them and kind of remake that connection again for the year. Like I said, this could be some bullshit in my head, but that's how I look at it. Well, the Irish and the Welsh, you know, that they're very connected with spirits of place and with the Fae right. and with the Tuatha Dan and the higher fairy folk. And they have a lot of legends and a lot of their holidays are intrinsically entwined with these creatures. So you can't really separate them. And I, I agree with, you know, historically, they're said to have come to Ireland on May 1st. So it, it makes sense that they would awaken at that time. There's also a lot of tales. You know how we talk about it, Samhain, that the veil between this world and the spirit world is thin? Right. You know, people also talk about at Beltane, that the veil between this world and the world of fairy is very thin. And so you need to be careful. Fairy magic is not to be trifled with. You don't make promises to them. You don't say thank you. Don't give them your real name. Don't bring iron. But it's a good idea usually to keep some iron back. What did we, we did a ritual to the Fae once. Didn't we take our athames, iron athames, and we bound our coven cords to the athame, struck it in the ground outside of the circle, and then tied the other end to our ankles while we were inside the circle, just to not bring that iron into the realm of the Fae, but to have us anchored to the real world with that iron in order to keep us protected. So be careful and don't fuck with the Fae. That's my advice. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, you know, I am such a fuck around and find out person. And even I am cautious. So just saying that. <laughs> yeah, but leave them offerings, especially in your garden. If you want to leave some seeds out, if you want to leave a little honey, honey, excellent offering, honey, fruit, sweet things like that, natural things, dried flowers. Uh, little baubles, things that are shiny. So that can be good too. Another tradition back in the day, we'll call it, is people used to often visit the holy wells on Beltane and they would pray to the wells for health and, you know, kind of good well water for the year. It really seems like the time of year in history where folks would kind of give blessings to the newness and give thanks to what has kept them through the hard winter. And they were hoping for that fertility. They were hoping for those blessings. And one of the ways that they celebrated that, that we continue today, is the maypole dance. You have the maypole itself, which represents the phallus, the god, and you put that into the earth, representing the goddess, and then you dance around it and weave ribbons to symbolize the union between God and goddess, the, the very spiral of life, you know, and, and the whole dance itself is, is raising joy and vitality. I just remember it, it our local community rituals way, way back. I would sit there and, and I know I would say this out loud. I don't know if you remember this. I would start chanting, put the pole in the hole, put the pole in the hole, <laughs> put the pole in the hole. I love a good maypole. And, you know, everybody out there, if you have a chance to participate in a maypole dance, good time, good time. Don't get twisted up, tied up or trip on yourself, but good time. Another thing that our particular community did in, in conjunction with the Maypole was we picked a May Queen and a May King, which is another traditional activity that goes back to these ancient rites of Beltane or Colin Ma? Colin Mai. Colin Mai. And they would usually pick a maiden that would represent fertility and, and the land that's waking up. And then a, a young man would get picked to represent the vitality of the god and the green earth and the Oak King. And the two of them would symbolize the sacred marriage, sometimes called the Heros Gamos, you know, the union of the earth and sky, the goddess and the god. I just want to point out that if I, if memory serves me, you, you were picked as May Queen, like at least twice. And I was never in my life May Queen, just saying. Just saying, just putting that out there. Being May Queen is pretty transformative, especially in our community. It, being May Queen or May King, it's chosen by chance, by fate, by chaos, by the goddess herself. You're tasked with carrying the energy of the community. And you feel that. It's an actual weight that you feel. There's there's a tad bit of responsibility that came with it. Like a, yes. I don't want to say like a spiritual responsibility, but kind of. It very much felt like it. It really did. The May King and May Queen were not expected to fool around or have sex in our community, although it, it wasn't unheard of. But in the past, traditionally, the idea was that the May Queen and the May King, after the ceremony, would go off. Test that fertility stuff. 
That's <laughs> right. And some people would wander off to the fields or to the forest or to someone else's home. And I don't know how historically accurate this is, but I've seen it, it mentioned quite a few times, and it was certainly taught to us coming up that it was not considered bad to go off into the forest with someone who was not your significant other. You went with whoever you felt like going with to fool around, to have sex in the woods, to bless the land. And any children that were born of these unions were considered holy. They were considered given by the goddess. And very often, whoever got pregnant, you know, sometimes a hand fasting would come from that to help take care of that child. Under Irish law, under Celtic law, they call it Brehon law. There were nine different types of marriage. And one of them was just specifically to look after children, which was probably the kind of hand fasting that they would do after a Beltane child was conceived. But, you know, it doesn't have to be all, you know, stranger danger either. We've mentioned this in a past episode. I, at one time in the past, had literally got married three days before. And we did a whole, I mean, we did a rich, we, we, we did a month long or two month long build up rituals to this. But our intention was I had had a girl already and I wanted a boy. And we kind of, did some Beltane magic to assist me in getting pregnant with a boy. And hey, you know, knock that one out of the park. Let's not tell my son that he is, you know, godly and holy because his head will expand way too big. <laughs> but, you know, these are things that, yeah, they did these a thousand or two thousand years ago, but these practices are still kind of upheld to a certain degree today and work. And although I think the emphasis on sex and Beltane really ramped up in the older communities, it was a Wiccan thing that very much played up the sexual aspect and everyone going off and having sex with each other. And while that was very prevalent in the 90s and early 2000s, that has very much slacked off in the last few years. Oh, yeah. While I wouldn't say that pagans are prudes by any means, um, I mean, polyamory was a thing in pagan groups that we knew and has been for decades. Any type of sexual flavor you can think of is okay as far as pagans go. But Beltane is all about the union of the god and the goddess. It does not necessarily have to mean a man and a woman. It means right. your anima and your animus, your active and your passive side, your what would be considered traditionally masculine attributes like will, like having will and strength and traditionally feminine attributes like emotion and nurturing and merging those taking that polarity and kind of finding a melding of that. And you can do that within yourself. You can do that with you and your partner. It does not matter what sex or gender at all that you are. You can find those dualities within yourself and within your partner. And a phenomenal way to do that is through sex magic. I know you're leading into our next topic, but I just wanted to take that thought and circle back to the bale fire. Mm -hmm. In our old community, there were people that, you know, they had no interest in the whole relationship fertility aspect. That wasn't where they were at, which is absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. So they would take that opportunity to jump the fire, to plant maybe a seed of intention, or, you know, they, they were still kind of fertilizing an idea, giving birth to a thought. So it doesn't have to be taken down the literal sexual road, even though if you're going to say that, if, is there a, a holiday in the pagan religion that has anything to do with sex? This is it. Not going to lie. But it doesn't have to be. It can be about, you know, impregnating your ideas, your intentions. I just wanted to put that out there. Yes. And this type of energy is something that if you're following the cycles of the year, if you're following the cycles of the seasons, the earth is exploding with abundance and new life. And you can use that for your own explosion into anything. You want to start school? Now is the time to plant those seeds so that it can grow. You know, you want to have a baby, you want to have a relationship, you want to buy a house, whatever it is you want to grow that you want to see become its own thing you know, like a, like a baby would be, I guess. Right. Now's right. the time to plant those seeds. It doesn't have to literally be sex equals the sex act. 
fertility equals baby. It can be fertility of ideas and right. creativity. You know, use those thoughts and transform them. I mean, we're fucking witches. That's what we do. We transform this energy. So you're taking this raw energy of all these rabbits that are out there and the birds that are having babies and the, the flowers that are bursting out of their ground. You're harnessing that new fresh growth energy and you're channeling it and transforming it to work your will, whatever that happens to be. I am like a 12 year old boy because you just said rabbits. And all I kept thinking about is fucking like rabbits. Such a Beltane <laughs> thing. But again, does not have to be. You know, in our old community, there was a tent off in the woods that was the Temple of Aphrodite. And you could go there and get your freak on. But a few fields away, we had crafts and, you know, kids making ribbons and doing hula hoop dancing and flower crown making. Flower crowns. Everybody had flower crowns on. And in the middle was dancing and bonfires and feasting. Those things were all there, kept separately. But, you know, you could honor and worship in whatever way you felt called to and comfortable doing. Consent at Beltane in sex magic in life. Consent is queen. That's what you need. Consent, consent, consent. Now, let's take a minute. What is sex magic? I mean... Are we just banging here? Like, where's the magic in it? Let's talk about that. Because, you know, I think this is where we get a bad rap, is this topic. Everybody thinks that witches are sex crazy. I guess just as sex crazy as your average person. Right. I was going to say, it's not like we're not, but, you know, just as much as Joe Blow down the street, you know. Before we get into what sex magic is, I kind of want to address the whole witches are sex crazy because i do think that we do have that image and a lot of it is because we have been so accepting of so we're so sex positive we're body positive we're people positive you know we have never had issues in the pagan community with lgbtqa never 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 any issues with trans people none of that I mean, we've talked before on Beltane episodes about how the very first May Queen of our pagan community was a, was a biological male. <laughs> and that's never been an issue. I can't help that I'm freaking sexy in black. That's very true. And you do. You a damn sexy, I might add. So, but, you know, polyamorous couples. I mean, we knew thruples back in the freaking 80s and it was no big deal. And communication and consent has always been a cornerstone of any pagan event that I have been to where anything sexual might possibly happen. Rules are stated in the beginning. There's a lot of communication. It's very open. I think the reason we get a bad rap for it is because pagans as a whole are non-judgmental. As long as you ain't hurting anybody, we don't give a fuck what you're doing. And exactly. it gives people kind of more of a platform to be themselves instead of hiding you can go and wear a raccoon tail and nobody's gonna blink an eye you know you can go and have a thruple and nobody's gonna blink an eye you can't necessarily do that in mainstream you, you know what i mean part of the bad rap is because we don't make a big deal about it right open relationships and things like that are only just now hitting the mainstream and they have been part of pagan culture for a long time and I think because we have been so sex positive and so sex open, that's why, you know, we're not afraid of sex or our own sexuality. And that scares people. And, you know, we're willing to have the conversations and we're willing to have, you know, talk about it and have discussions and other large groups maybe aren't and are right. uncomfortable with it. So that gives the appearance that we're sex crazed when yep. really... We're just okay with talking about it and don't give a shit what other people do. Exactly. Exactly. And like you said earlier, as long as you're not hurting yourself or anyone else, get your freak on. We don't care. We're not going to yuck anybody's yum. Yeah. And and I think right there is, is why we get a bad rap because, you know, we're not going to yuck their yum. Because sex is awesome and we're very happy having it and, you know, very happy celebrating it. It's part of life and there's nothing wrong with it. So we're just not afraid to say it. Yeah. And I think that sex magic plays a very important part because, you know, like we've talked about in raising energy episodes, sex is one of the best, most potent ways to raise a phenomenal amount of energy in a very short period of time. Whether by yourself with one or multiple partners, an orgasm is a shit ton of energy to put out into the universe. The trick 
is keeping your spell and your intention in your brain <laughs> while your partner is blowing your brain or right? other parts of you. <laughs> Which is why I personally recommend that don't be doing this unless the other person is aware. Like if, oh, if yeah. You know, yeah, consent for sex is one thing, but there has to be consent for magic during sex. Does that make sense? Yes. Sex, magic, consent. If you're raising energy with your partner, they should be aware of it. My recommendation for sex magic is it's very powerful. It's a fantastic way to do the energy raising part of your spell. I do recommend that if you're going to use it as the energy raising part, that you keep a chant or just a couple words in your mind to help you remember your intention. Or better yet, create a sigil for your intention and put it like on your headboard or on the mirror across from your bed or somewhere where you can see it while you're fooling around. So while you're having that orgasm or your things are really intense and you're raising that energy, you can just stare at that sigil and push the energy into it without having to have too many thoughts in your brain that's probably a little busy and occupied. I can't, I can't, I can't even tell you where I was just thinking a sigil could go. That's a whole different x-ray. <laughs> yes, bodily fluids. If you want to draw sigils in using bodily fluids, those are pretty powerful. If you have sex during your period, that can be also extremely magical. I have heard a lot of people think that you can accidentally bind someone to you if you have sex with them while you have your period. And I'm going to say, honey, there's no accidental about it. Right. If you're not thinking about a binding spell while you're having sex, period or no, you're not going to be doing a binding spell. But if you are. But if you are. So that that's really what I mean by accidentally. So it, just having sex with someone on your period or during a full moon or whatever, that in itself is not a spell. I don't care how mind-blowing the orgasm is, but having sex with someone and intentionally trying to bind them to you or weaving that magic, and you'll know that's what you're doing, you know what you're doing, right? then yes, that can bind someone to you. And again, that goes right back to consent, consent for the sex, consent for the spell. And you know, people think that, oh, if I bind him to me, he'll love me. Oof. Just be oh, careful honey, no. with that. I mean, put that up in the same category uh, as if I have his baby, he'll love me more. Yeah, no. no. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. and don't, it's the same thing as, you know, don't ever tattoo someone's name on you. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I guess right? that's another version of don't do sex magic and bind someone to you because it, it usually ends very badly. Bindings like that, even when your emotions and your feelings sour, that binding is still very strong and that's just going to create bad magic and bad energy between the two of you because it's just going to bounce along inside that binding and get worse and worse. And, you know, just with any other magic, intention is everything with, with sex magic. And it is easy to lose focus. Not going to lie. Mm -hmm. I, not that I know this, ha, ha, ha. But, you know, if you go into it knowing your spell and your intention and during climax, you focus on your intention. If you forget to focus for a minute in between, you're all right. Oh, yeah, you're totally OK. Sex magic energy is very, very potent. And honestly, you don't need to do anything differently. If you want to get out your magic wand, ha ha ha, or your uh -huh. rabbit, ha ha ha, you certainly can get your magical tools out for sex magic but you don't need to. What you really need is an intention. This can be as elaborate of a spell or ritual as any spell or ritual or as simple as drinking a cup of tea. It's up to you. And, you know, you're thinking, how can I do a ritual? You know, I have to cast a circle, sudden altar. You can cast a circle around your bed. Make your bed the altar. Yeah. You know, if you want to burn candles and incense, you know, what better for romance? You know, have a little wine or, you know, smoke a joint together ritually beforehand as part of your magic, as part of your spell. Shit, your whole date could be part of it. Go out to a nice dinner or make a dinner at home together. Depending on what your spell is, you could add ingredients to that dinner. Again, right. make this as fancy or as simple as you want. The spell could be in the spur of the moment. You and your lover are together and you're like, hey, let's have sex and raise energy to get better jobs or get a better house, get a better living situation, have a baby, you know, whatever it happens to be. And then both of you have that idea in your head as you're fooling around. That's all you need. You know, it, it really is something to be careful of because, you know, like you said before, this is another point of the year where the veil is thin. 
and spirit is here in your spells. Oh yeah, they're listening. Yeah. And especially if you're screaming something out in the middle of an orgasm, they're listening and they're paying attention. So make sure that you're asking for something that you really want, I guess. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> That's right. Especially if you get the fae or spring magic involved. Definitely be careful what you wish for, for sure. So for my son who's listening, we wish for you. Love you, buddy. Aww. I keep going back to Kama Sutra. There's the Kama Sutra. Oh my gosh, sex magic is definitely not a pagan thing. There's the whole Kama Sutra. There's um, Kundalini Yoga. People have been harnessing sexual energies for centuries. I mean, look at what Christians do. They make people not have sex ever as part of keeping their power to be like nuns and priests, right? They don't ever have sex. So controlling someone's sexuality is in all sorts of different religions. In our religion, using that energy to express yourself, to create energy, to do spell work is is very, very powerful. And also, I remember a time when it may have been the May King and the May Queen would act as like the, the incarnation of the god and the goddess. And the act of sex was the coming together of the god and the goddess. The heroes gamos, yeah, the great union. It wasn't even about, you know, Joe and Sally. It was Joe and Sally were embodying the God and Goddess. So it was almost like it wasn't them as people, like the God and Goddess were invoked into them, right. kind of using their bodies to fuck. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? It's the great right. It's the whole blade and the chalice. It's right. the, you know, the God and the Goddess. Just like, like the you literal said. great right the literal great right on Beltane in order to bless the fields, to bring fertility to everyone. So maybe for Beltane, if you're lucky enough to have a partner or partners, you can think of that energy going out to heal the land, to bring fertility and growth and joy back to everyone in your, you know, people in your circle, people you love. Although I guess that sounds kind of weird if you're having sex and you're like, I want my parents and my family to have all this great joy. (laughs) That might be a little odd. But okay, I've never done that in reference to my children or my parents. That's creepy and weird. Okay. No, no, I can't say I ever have either. But, you know, sending that energy out, that's an excellent way to to celebrate Beltane is to uh right? to have that joy if you if you want to do that. Again, all of these things don't necessarily have to involve a partner. You know, if you're out there single, play in the field, don't feel like, well, I can't participate in Beltane because I don't have anybody to fuck. It ain't about that. Set your intentions, plant your own seeds. Have sex with yourself. Have your own orgasm. Be your own seahorse, people. There you go. You know, find that duality within yourself. Have yourself a good old time and use that orgasm to power your spell. You don't have to have any partner whatsoever. Nothing wrong with that. So as you're celebrating your Beltane, just remember that this is one of the two very old celebrations that has been around for quite a while. I don't want to say the second most important or or tied for most important, but, you know, Beltane and Samhain, they're the two main out of our eight holidays, really. Yeah, you know how some people say that they're like Christmas and Easter Christians? Right. (laughs) Some people are Beltane and Samhain pagans, I guess. Right, right, right. (laughs) But those were traditionally the two that the ancient Irish, the Welsh, did celebrate. You know, the the other ones were lesser, were more localized, or were more modern inventions. But those two are definitely historically very, very old. So you are continuing a long line of people having sex and getting freaky for thousands of years. <laughs> <laughs> so get your freak on, have fun, celebrate the earth, celebrate yourself, celebrate fabulous sexuality and growing life. And make a flower crown. Make a flower crown. Go out and put your feet in the grass. Feel that new life all around you and celebrate new beginnings in so many areas of your life. Bring in that creativity, that vitality, and that joy. And just, you know, let the sun shine in, man. It's fucking gorgeous out. Plant your seeds, people. Thank you so much for listening to Back on the Broomstick. We hope you enjoyed our Beltane and Sex Magic episode. Thank you for all the comments and the likes. Keep them coming. Give us stars, reviews. We really appreciate it, and it really helps the show out. You can find us at backonthebroomstick.com, backonthebroomstick at Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. 
And also, we want to point out that we have a really awesome group of folks on a Facebook fan page. So check that out, too, because it's really actually kick ass. It is a lot of fun, very informative, some great people, great community back on the Broomstick Discussion Group on Facebook. So we hope to see you there. Sometimes Shell and I post there as well. I hope all of you out there are having a fantastic spring. Stay wise, stay wicked. And get freaky on Beltane and keep it witchy. There you go.